Okay, so yesterday we got our orientation, figured out what we have for a system, went into system inventory. Again, I'm hoping that everybody got a chance to try the system info gather tool. Oops, let me change my color here. But to be able to do a system underscore info underscore gather, this is an SGI script that comes out of uh, foundation and there's a SGI support tools RPM that it's coming out of. If you don't have foundation, you won't have this. Then a dash capital A for all areas. Uh, covering networking and DHCP and all the things that are there. And then for velocity level, I'm going to go with three Vs and then a dash N. And that would be something that the call center would typically ask for to be able to get everything about your system that's possible at one snapshot. Then we went into instrumentation and got SAR, PCP, I don't know if anybody did CSA accounting, but that's optional. But I implemented CSA accounting on Floyd 4 for demonstration purposes, but also because I like to use the data quite a bit. And one of the key things that it gives me is wait times, CPU weight, memory weight, IO weight, uh, memory trim weight, how long it takes to trim memory, recover memory, things of that sort. So now we got to get into our metrics itself. So different metric definitions here. We're primarily interested in megaflops, gigaflops, teraflops, number crunching, how many floating point operations we can get out of the system. Now I've been kind of going through three levels of statistics. The SAR PCP is coming out of slash proc. Then we've got our timing data. And then we've got our hardware data. And this is known as PAPI. So if I want to actually start tracking teraflop performance or something like that, I'm going to have to get into the hardware counters and PAPI to figure out what the processors are doing. And that's what we're going to get into tomorrow, is actually profiling getting to the hardware counters to count the number of operations per second or the number of floating point operations per second. Most of the statistics we've been dealing with right now have been a bandwidth type of statistic. There are two types of uh, bandwidth. A peak bandwidth or a theoretical bandwidth is basically something that's computed by the clock rate times the bus width. And now we've got things like DDR and DDR3 where we're able to skew clocks. With DDR2, we basically were clocking off the leading and the trailing edge of the clock. With DDR3, they're actually taking the clock tick and skewing it, uh, spreading it out to create three ticks within the normal tick and getting three times the clock rate for your theoretical peak bandwidth. And that's something that you can look up on the specs. But there's more things that go on with the bus than just data transfer. There's handshake protocols, things of that sort. So in the real world, we try to measure a sustained or a peak payload bandwidth, what we're actually getting and able to measure. What a lot of benchmarkers will do is they'll check out what the theoretical peak bandwidth is or the theoretical peak megaflop is and then measure what they're actually getting and try to get them as close to the theoretical as possible. There's another metric used in InfiniBand as well as uh, memory when we're in a topology type of system called the bisection bandwidth, which is basically a pneumotype measure giving the worst case across all blades or all hosts in an InfiniBand. InfiniBand has bisection bandwidth measurements as well. And then we've also got latency. Latency is time domain, time from the start of the axis, usually measured in milliseconds or getting down into nanosecond type of stuff. So when I get into a system, I want to look at the disk characteristics. Again, I gave you my Ferrari Schoolbot 747 story which is faster, that depends upon your payload characteristics. So SCSI drives and SAS drives are spinning faster to 15,000 RPM. SATA drives are more of a bandwidth type of drive. 
Now we actually have SSD drives coming in that lower our latency and replace the path spinning mechanical access of a mechanical type of device going into a, a solid state memory type of storage device. And again, some of our devices might be on a fiber channel, might be on a SAN switch, or might be off on InfiniBand. The rotational speed is going to determine my rotational latency, how long does it take to get to a particular track or sector of a track. And again, when I am in a lots of little I.O. operation situation, I really want to tune for latency. If I'm in a video market, large sequential, then I want to tune for bandwidth. And be aware, our disk drives, particularly the uh, Seagate fast drives, are what are called zone bit drives. They pack more sectors per track on the outer cylinders. There's more circumference to them. Your logical block counting starts at the outer cylinders. Block zero is at the outer cylinders, and we go towards the center of the drive. So my lower block counts on a device are going to have better bandwidth as we go towards the higher block counts and towards the center of the drive, the bandwidth is dropping off because there are less sectors per track. I should be able to see this here. Uh, let's see. Uh, two more slides. I've got an example showing what we were shipping for uh, UV1 and showing the bandwidth dropping off from 160 megabytes down to about 130 down in this range. Let me back up here for a second. So just giving a little bit of history of SCSI, showing what the bandwidths are. There is a tool called SG Mode tool that's in the SGI, RG, SG Tools RPM to be able to get to the PROM on SCSI. For example, whether write cache enabled is on or off. Then I'm also listing IDE, ATA, or now called PETA type of uh, devices. And then SATA. And for SAS, serially attached SCSI, again, this is a lower latency drive and a higher mean time between failure than a SATA drive. They do generally cost a little bit more. SAS is basically a point-to-point -point SCSI. There is no more daisy chaining. So there's no contention on the interface between the controller and the device. Terminology, the controller is called the initiator, and then the device is called the target. And you do have fan out capability on SAS called an expander. And also in the cabling, we have multiple physical data paths bundled in a single cable, and this is called a lane. We have multi-lane cabling giving me multiple parallel data paths, multiple physical parallel data paths on that cable. And again, with LSCSI-T, this first thing here is called the bus ID. And then with the T, we're actually able to get the target that we can then correlate with the LSI util. So here's the main thing that I want to get to today and tomorrow. This is the main emphasis right now of this module. When I'm going through the system, I'm trying to put together a puzzle. And I've got three layers that I'm kind of digging through. I started going into health of the system metrics. And I guess we're going to have to take off ESP that's no longer available. And I don't know of a replacement for it yet. Nagios was one that was being looked at. But one of the things I could get out of that was my mean time between interrupt, mean time between failure, how stable my system is. Then again, SAR and PCP, they are going into slash proc and getting things like utilization of the resource, how busy it is, and how many things are trying to use it, queue length. Not all resources have both utilization and queue length. This drives you do, but for example, memory, we get memory utilization, but we don't get any sort of memory queue length, how many memory loads and uh, reads or writes are going on with the system. We would have to go to hardware counters to get that sort of information. The second level that we need to get into more today is time to solution. Quality of service is always a time domain. And again, my quality of service for this class is I want to get code to shortest repeatable 
wall clock time. And yesterday we were in the 22nd range. And that was with GNU compiler, as I remember. Uh, let's see. And I know I can get that thing down to eight to nine seconds. And later in the week, we want to get that thing running through PBS with a CPU set and a D-place pinning so that each of the threads of that code, too, right now it's single-threaded, but uh, tomorrow and Thursday we're going to make it open MP and then lock it down in a CPU set, pin everything, and make it private and see if we can get down into the eight, nine-second range repeatedly. So I'm going to depend upon PBS accounting data. I've also, again, turned on CSA accounting data so that I can use that. And there are PCP probes that allow me to attach to a process, and then I can look at user time and system time for a PID. I'm not sure if I'll get time to do that this week, but the PCP probe is missing things like CPU weight, memory weight, and IO weight on a particular process. After I get my quality of service, then I want to be looking at my profiling. So this is stuff that I don't always run I, because it can impact the system, the production environment. Again, one profiling tool I used yesterday was S-Trace. We had these code fives running. I attached with S-Trace, and I could see them trying to open a file. And in fact, that open file was failing. And we were getting file not found type of messages. The other tool I'm going to get into tomorrow now is Perf. Perf is a standard Linux utility. I did use it briefly yesterday, but you got to be careful about Perf. Perf top can hang your system, particularly SLUS 11 SP1. So I don't think you're running SP2 at University of Alberta. Don't do just the Perf top. I'm going to put this into chat. What you, you can do, though, is a perf top dash P and then a PID. But I can do a perf top dash P on a PID. That's okay. It's when I'm doing a perf top on a large CPU system. The IO in, or the interrupt intensity is so high that it can actually start losing interrupts. And you may see on the newer kernels a dazed and confused message. are actually counted and all of a sudden it says, oh, there's some interrupts that have happened indicated by this counter, but I don't know what happened to them. And it gets this dazed and confused message on the system console. So don't run perf top alone. Now, I am doing it deliberately in class to kind of stress that. Also, by the way, it's worse when I run multiple perf tops. If we all logged in at the same time and did multiple perf tops, there could be a lot of problems with that. In fact, I do want to try that today. One thing I want to point out here, I did take an update yesterday with a newer kernel, and I'm going to try to stress that. But I don't want anybody else to go to that newer kernel yet because I can't find a debug info for it in order to use Crash. And with Crash, I'm taking a look at stack traces for sleeping processes. Let me come back to that as needed. So I was trying to get into PERF. PERF is an extremely useful tool, but it can be dangerous because of the intensity of the interrupts, particularly in large CPU systems. So you want to narrow down the use of PERF to a particular PID or a particular CPU. Another tool we're going to be using tomorrow, PS Run. PS Run is not integrated into uh, Linux. It is an NCSA application. And I have a tarball that you can use. So I'm not sure what NCSA pers or what uh, Alberta is using for profiling applications, or if they're even profiling anything. 
but PS Run can give me the line number where I'm spending all my time, and it can also give me the hardware counter. So with PS Run, I can see what my uh, gigafop performance is, for example. There's another tool. Again, Block Trace may not be working on your SLES 11 SP1 system. It is working, works on SLES 11 SP2. And Block Trace is actually able to trace each I.O. operation on the device driver and tell me where the I.O. request is going position-wise on the disk and how many blocks are going to be read or written from that particular position. So block trace can actually be plotted, and then I can look at head seeks, for example. Oracle has a tool called Seek Watcher that can use the block trace data and actually plot what kind of head movement I have in optimizing a uh, I.O. bound system like a database market. We want to reduce head movement and reduce seeks. Uh, one of the things we have to watch for is fragmentation and whether we want to defrag the file system. There are other reasons for head movements as well. So again, tomorrow we're going to get into the developer level and start profiling code 2 and using the PS Run utility. And also getting into what's called Perfex. I don't know if anybody remembers IRIX, but there was a uh, Perfex tool. So I can do a PS Run C Perfex and get 32 hardware counters. Uh, actually, I think it's only down to 30 hardware counters right now because a couple of the uh, hardware counter channels that can read data from are being used by other things for timer interrupts, like PerfTop uses one of them. So that's where we're going tomorrow. Today, I want to go through health of the system and quality of service. I will do some profiling as needed today. For example, that system time I'm seeing. But primarily, I'm going to focus on those two levels of statistics and then tomorrow get into the profiling. Now, again, when I am looking at the system, I'm going to go share a whiteboard here. I want to look at my resources, CPU, you can see me here in a minute, memory, disk, file system, which means the slab and metadata. Buffer, which is my raw slash dev IO, cache, which has many things, including, hang on here, dirty, right back, clean, uh, shamem. I need to break out that cached field in more detail today because a lot of things get thrown into that cached field. I want to come back to cached. So I want to look at CP memory disk, file system, buffer cache. Then we've got our inner process communication. And this is primarily LS on slash dev slash shamem and also IPCS dash A commands. Now inner process communication is out of memory. That stuff will show up in the cache field, as I mentioned here. And again, this data is coming out of the mem info file. Slash proc slash mem info will give me information about memory use in these four areas. So CPU memory disk, file system buffer cache, inner process communication. I'm not going to worry about networks, but then I have miscellaneous, which in my case is Numalink. And again, I'm hoping that PM Logger is capturing the UV statistics. So that's the drill I'm going to be going through the rest of the week, explaining as I go along, but trying to get through quickly what CPU is doing, what's memory doing. And again, with each of them, I want to know how busy. How many users, how many things are trying to use it? Oops. 
how long, i.e. service time. And right now, for example, code two was at 20 seconds. And then how long to wait. And we're gonna have things like CPU wait, IO wait, memory wait, swap wait. One of the commands that I do need to get into today in this how long to wait is a command called get delays. Dash D dash P PID. And this is going to give me IO wait times. And this is what CFA uses. Now I don't know how much detail, Brian, I don't know what you get into here, but I have my own tool called task logger that gets CSA stats for a running proc. And I do want to play with that a little bit this week too. So if I don't have CSA but I got a process running, I can attach to the PID and look at the CPU weight, the memory weight, the IO weight, the trim weight times on it. So this is a puzzle, filling out my resources and looking to see what kind of usage those resources have. A lot of people are narrow-minded and they just look at CPU and they say, I've got a performance event, and they just look at CPU. And they're not looking at the other resources. For example, for the past day, I've been pounding on the file system piece. And I don't know if you've been feeling any impact from that, but the things that were uh, Using the slab, anything that's trying to create or destroy inos like RPM or something, is going to be slower because there's contention on the metadata. Also, I'm out of memory, and if I try to recover memory, the first thing that I trim is the slab. The slab is the first thing that is going to try to push down to recover memory. And I want to see how good it does it this week, but in prior kernels, pushing down the slab can be slow. I don't like to see the slab big. I don't want to get to a site and see, you know, a 500 gigabyte slab or something like that, because it can take time to push that stuff down and recover that memory. Any questions on this concept right now? Now, I don't know if you have a hard copy, but in your workbook, and Brian, you've probably seen this before, but Erming and Camille, there should have been a tab that says cheat sheet, cheat sheet on it. Yes. So this is kind of a, a little cheat sheet to help people remember what kind of commands and options are appropriate. So I spend all my time playing with these tools to pull apart whatever I'm seeing. And uh, this is just kind of a reminder for all the different things that I'm going to go for and grab. I'm hoping that Erming and Camille can find this. There, there should be a tab towards the end of the workbook that says cheat sheet that has this little sheet on it. It's worthwhile to pull out of the workbook and just have handy. So again, it's, it's a puzzle, and generally when I look at a system, I kind of go across this like this. So I want to look at CPU first. Memory second, IO third. I want to look at health of the system metrics, then get into my time domain and get whatever quality of service metrics I can get. And again, I am listing CSA commands here that I still use, but we still have things like the time command, PS, and get delays, for example. And then the third level, when I'm getting into profiling the code, this is when I am an efficiency expert looking for non-productive resource consumption. Let me go back to my whiteboard for a second, just use this one. And one of the things I'm looking at when I'm looking at how busy it is, I'm looking at contention. So contention will, if I'm busy, will indicate that there's contention. And number of users, as that goes up, my contention is going to go up. 
Also, my service time will go up because now I've got multiple processes sharing the caches, and I'm taking a lot more cash misses than I would before. And also, since there's a lot of processes trying to share that user, my CPU wait time is going to go up. And the other thing I'm looking for is thrashing. Now, thrashing is a term that's been around for a long time. Thrashing is basically trying to say I'm doing non-productive resource consumption. There's a variety of different things that can thrash. Traditionally, historically, thrashing on swap was a common way of using the word thrash, saying that I bring the page in and then I run out of memory, swap it out, bring it back in, and I thrash on swapping where I'm spending all my time swapping in and out rather than getting work done. We can thrash on system time. We can thrash on our our head disk heads. So thrashing is non-productive resource use, and you need to profile to spot thrashing. And that's where we're going to go tomorrow. We'll start looking at thrashing. Now let me go back to my cheat sheet. Once I got into profiling the code, I can then identify what the problems are. I cannot really identify a problem until I have profiled. So I could have high user time and perf and top are showing me that I'm CPU bound, but until I get the hardware counters, I cannot tell whether I'm doing cache misses, TOB misses, or other types of cache problems. Cache stride is how I walk through the data known as rows versus columns. When I reference memory, I'm getting 64 bytes copied into the processor. That's the cache line size. And I want to be able to process every 64 bytes on that cache line before I go on to the next cache line. If I do a uh, column type of reference, I'm going to only work with like the first eight bytes and then go on to the next cache line and not take advantage of all items that are on that cache line. A typical variable is eight bytes, telling me that I've got typically eight items, eight variables on a cache line because they're 64 bytes in size. So you might have a program that was, for example, written for a Cray 1. It's 40 years old, and it has a stride that was meant for a Cray interleaved memory type of problem. Or you might have a Fortran program you've converted to C, and now the data is striding through the process, the program, the algorithm striding through the data in an inefficient manner, rows versus columns type of information. What we want is a stride one such that we load 64 bytes and do all operations on the 64 bytes. Also related to that is TOB misses. This is how, again, I stride through my data. Default page size on our system is 4K bytes. Now, this is another rows versus columns example, and I've got a program example later, matrix A, matrix B, where the only difference is how I stride through the array, JI versus IJ. Another type of problem is what I call cache busting. This is when my data set is bigger than the caches. Now, again, with the CPU or the topology command, I can see how big my caches are. Cache busting is when, for example, we had a uh, 256K byte L2 cache, and if I break up my array, chunk it, or decompose it, I'd like that chunk to fit in my core's L2 cache. If I can solve, solve all my computational operations out of cache and never have to go off core, that's going to be my best performance in what's called a super linear speed up. Sometimes when you're multi-threading, you're not going 128 threads wide for the CPU work. You're going 128 threads wide so that when I decompose, chunk, or break up my array, it fits on core. And I don't even have to go to the L3 cache or go to memory to get to my data. Now, compilers are going to do cache, deal with cache busting on their own as well. There's something called blocking. And the compilers will automatically block the array into chunks that fit the cache. 
And what blocking does is if I've got multiple operations on the data, I do all operations on that block before I go on to the next block. So if I have a terabyte array and doing an add, a subtract, a multiply, and a divide, I'm not going to go through the entire array and do the add and then come back through the entire array and do the subtract. Instead, I'm going to load a block of the data into cache and do the add, subtract, multiply, and divide all operations on that block before I get to the next block. In other words, solve everything out of cache. Stay in the L2 area and solve everything off the core, and you're going to get what's called a super linear speed up. So the compilers take care of busting by doing what's called blocking. Also, though, when you're going multi-threaded, how you choose your thread width and how you chunk decompose the array can also affect the cache busting behaviors. Another behavior that we're going to look at tomorrow, cache thrash. This is where I basically keep rereading my cache because somebody else came in and used it, for example. Uh, we need to talk about set associativity tomorrow. So set associativity is a hardware feature of the caches. And I want to save that discussion for tomorrow. The other type of cache thrash, though, is from the CPU scheduler sharing that cache. So uh, tomorrow I'm going to start driving up the load level in these code twos, and we were at like 20 seconds. I want to see if I can push it to 20 seconds just from noise and other code twos sharing that same CPU. Again, I can't spot the difference between any of these without getting into hardware counters. Uh, last thing tomorrow afternoon and into Thursday, then we're going to get into the multi-threading situations. And a, a behavior that I talk about called barrier synchronization, this is basically communication overhead when I'm multi-threading. I like to compare barrier synchronization to uh, playing phone tag. I call you, you're not there, you call me, I'm not there, and I sit there saying, are you done, 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 and I keep playing phone tag with the other threads. So we need to get into barrier synchronization. That's probably the number one problem that I see out there these days. Another effect called false cache sharing. This is what drives CC NUMA and directory memory hot. False cache sharing is when multiple threads are sharing the same 64-byte cache line, sharing the same 64 bytes of memory. And as I get more and more threads wide, if they're all stepping on that same cache line, it's called a hot cache line. And one of the things we try to do is decouple the items that are on that cache line. Again, by default, it's 64 bytes to a cache line. And you might have an object that's eight bytes in size, giving me eight objects on that cache line. And if all eight objects are write variables and everybody's writing to that cache line, you're going to get CC NUMA constantly sending interrupt interventions, invalidations to the other CPUs through the hub, through CC NUMA, using directory memory, and telling those other processors, I just changed the cache line, rewarm it. Well, if everybody's doing this, that cache line gets stepped on by everybody, then everybody's constantly driving CC NUMA hot. What we try to do once we find the hot cache line is decouple it and pad and waste things and push things onto the other cache lines. By the way, the compilers at O3 do quite a bit of this for you already now. So instead of having eight objects in the cache line that's 64 bytes, I may just have one item on that cache line, waste and pad the rest of the cache line, but now I have decoupled the objects on that, on that cache line. You can also get false cache sharing in the data array itself, what's called boundary conditions. If two threads are working in the same memory area of the array, where it's been chunked and some of the bytes falling on one side of the cache line and some of the bytes are on the other side, both chunks of this array sharing the same cache line. And that's one reason, for example, you don't want to use odd uh, thread counts or odd chunk counts. You want everything to fall on cache line boundaries. 
And the last effect that we're going to look for on Thursday, in particular Friday, is latency. Again, everything about these systems is to lock it down, privatize the core, don't let anybody else use it, and stay on socket, and even better, stay on L2 cache and never have to go off socket. So NUMA latency, if I go to the other blade or go off, go to the other node on the blade or go off blade, I'm going to take a bandwidth penalty and I'm going to take a latency penalty. Now, if I have short bursty stuff, that's probably not going to be bothersome to me. But if I have something that runs for eight hours, the latency could actually push it up to 10 or 12 hours and create a uh, inconsistent timing for the process. So this, again, is why we go into CPU sets, private CPU sets, but also to use D place within those CPU sets to pin things down. I'm kind of done with this story right now. Is there anything you want to ask? So going back to my, uh, let's see what happened here. Going back to my analysis hierarchy, as I'm going through my data, I might see high CPU utilization, but I don't know if that's good or bad. I need to get to my time domain to figure out how long that thing is running. So I could have high CPU utilization and long CPU time because it's thrashing on something, or I could have low CPU utilization but short time to solution because there's no thrashing. And this is something that's counterintuitive to a lot of data center managers. They want to drive up CPU utilization to make sure the CPUs are used. But in fact, the usage might be not productive in simply creating a time domain problem. So I want to look for what my resource consumption is like, then get to my time domain, and then it's the profiling that helps me identify what the particular behavioral problem is. We still out there? Any questions? So that's where we're going. Let's see what else is in this workbook. I got to choose the right metric. So data center managers care about productivity. They want the system up all the time. They want number of jobs per day. They want CPU hours. I've seen sites that will actually plot the CPU hours per month by division and then plot that out for a five-year interval. Uh, some sites will do a resource utilization. I used to be able to see a cork board outside the data center and plots up there showing CPU utilization or memory utilization. Nowadays, we have ganglia to do that, and I need to get ganglia running today. And also just being able to watch run levels. And one thing nice about PCP is I could put all the run levels for all my systems around the world into one plot. Now, we need to get back to the run level and describe what it is. Also, another metric might be arrival rate, number of IO op, number of database requests per second, number of uh, IOPS per second, number of web hits per second, uh, number of jobs submitted per second. Particularly, web servers and database servers are going to have some sort of arrival rate as the proper metric. Can my system take a million web hits per second as it gets hot on the world. Data center managers care about this, but me as an end user, I just care about me. I'm selfish. I care about my quality of service, and I want a interactive response time so that when I hit a carriage return, I get my prompt back, that VI and MAN are usable. And a lot of that is subjective. So I've been using that subjectively up till now, meaning that my perception says system is taking a little bit here. What's going on? But I need to get that into something that I can measure. And that's why I've got CSA on, because now I can go back and see what CSA is telling me. So then I want to get into the quality of service metric, the last time, which is objective. and measurable, and things like the time command, CSA com, 
and also things like the PBS report all can give me elapsed time. But one of the things I try to do here now is break that into elapsed time components. And again, CSA with CSA Tom JA helps me in that area. And I also have the get delays and a command that I've got called task logger. So we're going to come back to elapsed time components once we start getting some data. As an end user, I just care about how long it took me, CPU time to solution. So I've got a site that when they run it once, it comes in at eight hours. If they run it again, it's coming in at 20 hours. If they run it again, it never finishes. So we need to pull that elapsed time component apart and figure out is that user time, system time, I await time, memory wait time, swap wait time, what is the last time components of that eight hour job that might be taking 20 hours? One problem with jobs that never finish is you may not be able to get the data out of it until it actually cleanly terminates. So things like PS run may not help you in that situation. Okay, so availability metrics come out of uptime and W and mean time between interrupt used to be ESP report, but that's been pulled from my systems. I'm not seeing it on this release right now. So I'm just going to skip over ESP at this point. But it can give me uh, ESP report summary and availability. So here's an availability report showing me my downtime, availability and percentage, mean time between interrupts, and most and least uptimes and downtimes. And then here's a summary report, which is basically just watching var log messages. Now, when I am uh, doing an analysis, one of the first things I want to do in my inventory is figure out what's the server for. Why did they buy it? Uh, right now, I'm working on a workstation, and we're connected to compute servers. And I'm expecting that most of what uh, both of you are working are in the scientific number crunching type of market. There are also markets out there where it's a real time, uh, military simulators, flight simulators, things of that sort. Data acquisition, where it is uh, retrieving video streams from a uh, camera that might be on a satellite or something like that, and acquiring data coming down. Or maybe it's some sort of uh, missile tracking system or something, telemetry system that's acquiring data and predicting the uh, direction of the uh, projectile that they're trying to shoot down, for example. We also have different types of file servers, which is a whole different market. CXFS and Luster are quite common. I have NFS configured on my system. That's going to have its own problems. And you might be Saba or Apple Talk. Also getting into web servers and database servers. Now, the hard part about the database market is you may tune the file system for online transaction processing, which means lots of little I.O. operations. But then you need to post-process that data later, which some people would call strategic business analysis. It used to be called data mining. Now it's just called big data. And you're trying to crunch the data in large sequential chunks and look at trend analysis. You also have sites that are doing digital media production, CNN, the NBA, things of that sort, uh, usually large sequential type of data. Probably the most difficult market, as uh, University of Alberta knows, is the multi-user timeshare. You have a large diversity of users, and they all don't necessarily use it efficiently. Universities are usually the most difficult, and they have politics involved with them, too. Different divisions that have shared it. And that's what leads to batch systems like PBS and Torque, and Moab on top of Torque as a scheduler. Also, the university market will often have application development, so this is the area that they may actually be doing more profiling and tuning of applications as well. There are a couple other server types that I wouldn't be using a UV on, but being able to deal with news, mail, and NIS. 
type services. So I've got to establish what my workload unit is. When I get to a site, I've got to say, how do I know if you're happy with the quality of service that you're getting, the performance? How did you measure performance? Some of that may go back to the benchmark. If it's a web server, I care about web hits per minute, database engine, transactions per second. Uh, there might be markets like digital signal processing was typically integer, and maybe I care about MIPS per second. In the scientific market, we're usually number crunching large arrays that are in a floating point. In the batch market, number of jobs per day, number of car crashes per day, number of jobs or some sort of throughput metric. How much work am I getting done? If it's a uh, interactive user service, number of interactive users on it, if I'm logging into AOL or uh, something like that. We also have a large market for video servers, including when I'm on that plane, that's Linux delivering the video stream off to all the individual t uh, TV monitors that are in the back seat, in the seat in front of you. And how many simultaneous video streams you can go before you start getting, for example, flickering and stuff. And also, uh, most systems that are large, we do a benchmark. We may use some general specs, general metrics, uh, but then we actually want to run the actual applications that we're going to be running on that system to get a real-world benchmark. So again, I want to get to my elapsed time components. The time will give me the service times, but not the, the wait time. So get delays is a Linux tool that will give me CPU wait, disk wait, swap wait, and it also gives me a memory reclaim wait, how long my process waits to push memory down and recover memory. And I'm going to start using those as much as I can. So some just some common benchmarks out there, spec we run all the time, database market transaction processing, NASA floating point, uh, o OMP, multi-threading, stream, LINPACK, Bonnie for file systems. There are some of these out in the guest SysA directory in a lab for you to try running them, but that's going to be optional at this point. When I do get into a benchmark, the first thing I try to do is make sure the benchmark is relevant in real world. Some of these benchmarks are so small that they will fit into the cache nowadays and not show the speed up. If you take a processor, and other vendors have that same processor, and you are able to get your application to fit on that processor, you're not going to see the difference. It's on the high end when you start getting into 40, 96 CPU systems and stuff that the payoff starts showing up. So you want to show your problem on the large end of the, the data set size, not on the small end. Also, and I'm going to have to do this week, run the experiment long enough and run several times for what's called a confidence interval. I want to look for a very little variance. I'm going to look for a small variance between runs. Sites will call that deterministic. I want it deterministic. And if I'm paying for this, I, I don't want an eight-hour job to take 24 hours the second time and that that 16 hours of difference or whatever is all non-productive thrashing. A lot of this is usually due to the cash thrash effects. So this is where we want to lock things down, privatize them, make sure that nobody else is using them. And multi-threading has other additional variability issues. The two things there is communication and fault sharing. Again, in my benchmark situation, I'm going to turn off all unnecessary services. If you don't need them, turn them off. I've even done some benchmarks where I turned off networking and everything and came in through the serial console just to see what it would run like without any network traffic and any networking going on. In fact, right now, I can see traffic going from blade, the second blade in my cluster, in my partition, to the base I/O blade, and maybe that's network traffic. And if I want to confirm that, I might even turn off networking and see if my traffic goes away. Also, in the real world, we don't just run one thing. So a benchmark at a job mix type of site will usually say, "I want to run three copies of this, five copies of that." Uh, the benchmarkers like it easiest when it's just one run, run application, 
and there's no contention between things. But that's not the way the real world is. Uh, the hard part on some of these things is being able to get a workload generator to fire it up. Uh, what sites will do, and basically what we're doing in our systems now, is after the system is configured and stabilized, the data center is then going to say, let's open it up to the community for a week, let them pound on it and see what kind of uh, load problems they can create, and then stabilize it from there. So a lot of sites will actually have a one-week exposure window where the workload generator is the user community. Now, when I get into a, a situation where I'm doing a health of the system check type of report, I'm going to get into an interview situation, figure out what the machine is, the OS they're running, the rev level, the release level, what are their top five applications, and what is their server type. Are they batch, are they interactive, are they web server, database server? Then as I triage their system, I've got to deal with reliability and fail safe problems first. And for example, we often look to see if preferred path has had a rollover on RAID storage. Uh, have we had any need time between interrupt stability problems? Second thing is I'm looking at the system, do I have bugs, do I have hangs? What kind of software problems am I seeing that might be resolved by a patch or a bug that has to be reported? Or do I have a performance problem from configuration? For example, I'm going to look at the itsy sysctl.com type of file to see if they've added anything in there. And then also, is the performance problem because of its overcommitted or loaded? And for that, I need a baseline of SAR data over a month. People are asking what's a good number, what's a bad number. That's what I need the baseline for, and I'm hoping to get to that today. The next thing, when they're talking to me, I need to get from subjective to objective. So I got a site that says I run it for eight hours one time, run it again is 24 hours. But they're not able to give me a time stamp to say the user time went up, the system time went up, or it was IO wait time or memory wait time. I am not getting elapsed time components from the site, so I can only do what I call a leap of faith and assume that every time they look, it's CPU bound. And if it's CPU bound and multi-threaded, I'm going to look for barrier synchronization or communication problems first. In the process, I got to know if they are seeing something that's objective and can be measured, what tool and metric are they using? So I've got this one site using PERF quite a bit. But with PERF, they're only looking at user and system time. They're not looking at wait times. So for wait times, they need to be able to get to the stack trace. And for some of these sites right now, I am doing an echo T into slash proc slash sysrq dash trigger to see sleep events, WCHAN events, what it's sleeping on. So again, perf can tell me about user time and system time, but it can't tell me about wait time. So being able to get to a trace back of all the process on the system conveniently. I did start to do that early in the week, and we're going to come back to that as needed. Again, as I'm asking them, is it an interactive response to this problem or a batch type of problem? So I get up a site saying the system is slow, and what they mean is interactively, my interactive environment is sluggish. But that could be due to a batch application that's doing real good. Again, SAR and PCP cannot sort out different types of workloads. So I might be 100% busy and one application is doing real good and another application is being marooned and you can't spot that from PCP. I actually consider performance copilot to be an oxymoron. There's nothing in PCP, there's nothing in performance copilot that gives me performance. In other words, there's nothing that's really giving me time to solution. PCP and SAR just tell me what to look for, not whether I've got a problem or not. Also in my interview, I've got to sort out politics and whether I'm doing any partitioning. And lastly, I need to know, are we talking single-threaded, OpenMP, 
we're going to take code two and make it parallel, basically auto task it and let the compiler make it open MP. And I'm also tomorrow going to get into MPI applications, and we've got P threads, and also whether we got hyper threads or not. And there are some applications that call clone directly. In other words, clone is what P threads uses to spawn processes. I should actually say spawns threads. Fork creates processes, clone creates threads. So there's some applications that call clone directly, which means there are not library uh, interfaces in between that can have environment variables to affect them. Just about ready for a break here. So I now have to figure out in my uh, interview process, why was I called? What, what's the complaint? What are the specifics? So I've got different sites. Stalls on one site where memory is a problem. Uh, inconsistent run times where CPU and multi-threading seems to be a problem. I have to figure out what the complaint is. And again, I have to get it from something subjective to something that's measurable. If I had my way, I would have a month's worth of data, and hopefully in lab you've got the star figured out so that at the end of the week you can look at the entire week's worth of data. Now, there was ISAG for star data. I also have a tool called SPV. It's from me, and SPV will basically plot my SAR or PCP data, and that will get me baseline type of information. And I intend to use that this week when I get into uh, baseline analysis. Also, dealing with a site, I might want some sort of incident log to keep track of what's going on with the system. If I've got a help desk to be able to log the help calls, maybe there is an event occurring and I can get a timestamp and then go back into the data and look at it a couple hours later. And again, when I am looking at this, I've got to say, are we talking interactive problem degradation or batch? In my analysis, the first thing I want to do is, has anything changed in the environment? Do I have a one-month baseline? What has changed? And I'm going to try to correlate subjective metrics, subjective complaints to the metrics. So, for example, I've got one situation where there is a 30-second stall in uh, open vault, and we're trying to narrow down in the time domain what's happening during that 30-second stall. And we're actually, when it's stalling, firing up a SysRQ trigger dash T to look at the tracebacks whenever those stalls occur. And right now it's looking like an XFS log routine that is always there during the stall. So trying to get from the time domain rather than just saying CPU is busy. You're not going to see everything from SAR. If I'm sleeping, SAR is not going to tell me much about that. PCP won't help me there. And again, if it's waiting, even time won't help me there. That's when I need to get into things like get delays. But get delays only works on running processes. CSA, hang on here. CSA is for exited processes. And that's where I'm trying to get back into the time domain and elapsed time components. Also, if I have the chance to be able to experience the system myself, I've got a little bit more experience at jumping around and knowing what tool I want to use to look at a particular thing that jumps out at me. And there are times where I may need to reset expectations. Right now, the most common expectation that I try to reset is NumaLink should not be abused. One of the key things in tuning these large UV systems is to reduce your interconnect traffic. You don't want to be pushing everything across everything. So I'm just going to do a drawing here, and I've got two sockets here, two sockets here. So I'm just saying that I've got four blades here. And they all go to some sort of interconnect. 
And if I've got a process running here, and let's make this a big system. Let's say this is node zero or blade zero. This is blade 28, just to pick one. This is blade uh, 80. And this is blade one twenty or blade one twenty eight. And I don't want to be generating data here. And then the kernel I do a write and the kernel says, okay, let's distribute it round robin and spread the data. Let me change my color here. So now we're going to take that data that I wrote and copy it to the page cache and maybe that's off on one twenty eight into the page cache. And then the flush daemon wakes up, and the flush daemon says, oh, this data is dirty, let's write it to disk. And now we take that data that was on 128 and push it off to blade zero, where the PCI interface is. And again, if I had multiple paths, eight failover paths, I'm just not going to want to push everything across everything. I need to reduce my interconnect traffic. One of the things that uh, XVM does is it finds an affinity path. If I have multiple failover paths configured, XVM will say, let me find the closest HBA, not just do a round robin spread across everything. Again, I'm trying to keep it local and be NUMA aware and keep my latency as low as possible. So one of the key things that I keep trying to say is not push everything across everything. Reduce my interconnect traffic. Just because I've got huge memory everywhere doesn't mean I want to abuse it. Other thing is uh, salesmen generally don't know what the workload is going to be like when they're done, and they're trying to make a bid, and they don't know the workload. If they don't know that this is an IO operation intensive situation like a database market, they might sell them video RAID devices rather than database RAID devices. So we're going to take a break here, but this is what I'm going to be doing today is going through health of the system and quality of service. I already have CSA turned on, so that helps me. And during demo today, I need to get PBS Pro running so that I get some quality of service there. And I'm going to be doing this on Floyd 4. But I'm also going to do some analysis on the other Floyds. Tomorrow, then, we get into profiling. I'm going to use it a little bit, but tomorrow is when I'm actually going to uh, cover it. So if I go back to my cheat sheet here, health of the system, I am a psychologist, a shrink, a therapist. I'm just saying, what kind of behavioral problems can I look for? Then the quality of service, I'm an accountant looking at time domain, number of jobs, keeping track of where my resources are going and being used. Then the third level is I'm an efficiency expert profiling the code, looking for non-productive resource consumption. And lastly, from those three pieces of the puzzle, I then identify my problems. Now this week we're going to look at user time and system time. The advanced sysadmin class gets into some of these other types of problems. So, any questions right now? Okay, I've got uh, 20 minutes to the hour approximately. Let's come back at five minutes to the hour. Take a 15-minute.